and introduce Caroline Coates now. Um, Caroline is a consultant cardiologist at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and is the lead clinician in the ICC service in Glasgow. Um, she's also an honorary senior clinical lecturer in the School of Cardiovascular and Metabolic Health at uh, Glasgow Uni and she's going to talk to us today about ICC services in Scotland. Thank you Caroline. Hey, thank you. Um, you. Just check you can hear me all right. Yes, we can. Yeah, perfect. And you can see the slides. Great. So thanks for asking me to come and speak. Um, is anyone from Scotland in the audience? Probably, I imagine probably not. But um, it, it's, um, I guess I, I slightly wondered why, why you want me to speak. And it's partly because we obviously do have a devolved health service and things are done a little bit differently. Um, I did you spend most of my training actually in London. So I, I'm really conscious about how services are organised in, in various places as well. So hopefully it's of interest and um, helpful to, to people wherever they work. So so Scotland, for those of you that haven't visited, is, is a is a beautiful country. Um, there's beaches, mountains, cities, everything um, you could want. Um, the geography of it, however, is is quite challenging when you're thinking about delivering healthcare. Um, so it's there are really rural areas, there are socially isolated communities. And then there are also areas where there's really very static populations. And in many ways, that's that's an ideal uh, place to have inherited cardiac condition services. So are these coming through as I scroll through the slides? You want, are you seeing? Yes, they are, thanks, Karen. Yeah, great, okay. Um, so, yeah, so Scotland's a bit different. It's it, There's a bit more central control um, in terms of the budget. So they get a lump sum from, from Westminster. And then there's principles of equity of access across all of the health boards are, are really important. So any specialist service of which inherited cardiac conditions is, is considered to be um, has some national oversight. So practically everyone who's resident in Scotland lives in a health board. Um, everyone should have access to a genetic service and they're located in the main major cities. So every health board has a, a genetic service that they're linked to. Now each of those genetic services come together and there is a single funding pot and approach to genetic testing. So that means that the same panel is done whether you live in Aberdeen or Edinburgh and it's, it's done and reported in the, in the same labs. Um, we're a population of 5.4 million so actually it's it's, it's a relatively small population. It does make things a bit easier to get things organized at, at national level. But there are obviously huge differences in, in how populations are amongst the country and different regions have different challenges with rural and, and uh, their, their own populations. So in Scotland, um, health services that are specialist or need uh, cross-disciplinary work are organized through what's called a managed clinical network or an MCN. And they've been around for about 25 years in Scotland. And the principles of an MCN are really to try and bring together uh, people that can provide expertise, whether it's within the National Health Service or outside and across lots of disciplines. So you can see that the heritage cardiac conditions really lends itself to this. And the first um, MCN that was set up in Scotland was uh, actually called FAMS, which stood for Familial Arrhythmia Network of Scotland. And it was really born out of the need to address sudden cardiac death and to provide better care for families that had been affected by a, an often young sudden death. And the reason that was so challenging to do was they're generally rare, they require services outside of the NHS. So in, in Scotland, that's the fiscal service, um, which is like the coroner service in England. And it was Anna-Marie Choi who really led the initiation of that, that clinical network in Scotland. And you can see in, it was launched in 2010, so 13 years ago now. And there's a young looking Nicola Sturgeon in the middle of that picture. So with time, uh, that network has evolved into what we now call NICS, which is the Network for Inherited Cardiac Conditions of Scotland. And it encompasses not just investigation of sudden cardiac death, but also inherited arrhythmias, inherited cardiomyopathies, and we're doing some work at the moment about potentially including inherited aortopathies in, in there, but there is some overlap in, in service provision with, with congenital 
heart disease. Um, so the purpose is to link people across boundaries, across both geographical boundaries and also service boundaries, so that the, um, that the uh, local services can be delivered. So the network gets a little bit of money from the government, and it's a small amount of like several thousand pounds, and that funds essentially some administrative support to facilitate meetings, to organise educational events, to link in with with broader um, activities that are happening across different networks. So you know, there's a cleft palate network, there's a there's a network for um, neuromuscular conditions. And within that network, there's a very accountable um, chain of, of things that have to be delivered. So you need a, a, a clinical lead of it at the moment. And your role is to, to promote the network, but also to, to promote best practice and ensure that there's equity of access across, across the country. Um, but at the same time, the, the desire is to pro pro provide that access as close to home as possible. The network's role is also to ensure that there's good engagement with all the stakeholders. So that's people um, that have conditions, it's their family members that look after them, and it's organisations like the charity sector, Cardiomotic UK, CRY, Arrhythmia Alliance, all the, the various um, organisations that support the delivery of these clinical services. But most importantly, the network has to demonstrate that changes are happening and those are effective because ultimately the network won't be funded if uh, it doesn't deliver what it's asked to do. So it's quite a good structure. Um, there are pros and cons of this approach and I'm really just sharing what our experience is here in Scotland. So these are some of the things that we do as a network. Um, we provide clinical guidance and a, a all that guidance rather than guidelines because we very much try not to rewrite guidelines that are discussed and uh, you know produced with huge teams of people now internationally we couldn't possibly replicate that there is um, areas for, for local guidelines but most of it is actually what we call clinical guidance so it's really about what to do how to do it and specifically how to do it in your area so I've got a patient with this condition, how, how do I facilitate the best care for them? So this is an example of, we tried to provide guidance for GPs particularly. Um, really, we listen to what they want and try and provide it, but provide it at a national level. So this is an example of a common referral into general cardiology, which is someone's got a long QT on their ECG. So when do you worry? When can it go to general cardiology? When can you repeat it? and uh, really the thresholds for referral. So quite simple um, guidance for a, for a practicing GP. We try to be consistent across all of the services um, by having the same letter footer for anyone with inherited cardiac conditions so that the GP, the patient, the family can be referred, signposted to, to information. We've really uh, done quite a lot of work to try and encourage ICD-10 codes and read codes, which is the GP coding system, so that people's diagnoses are accurately coded on their primary care records. And the reason for that is that provides a, a way into national data linkage and, and ultimately audit and improvement of services that Steve was alluding to. So that's some of what we do. I'll give you an example. And because this is a session about arrhythmias and sudden death, I thought I'd uh, just show you the work that's been done uh, recently to, to update our sudden death guidance. So you've probably seen this at some point today. So this is the project that's happening in England about a national programme. I see it's, it's they seem to have cut off Wales, Ireland and Scotland, but it's uh, the title is the United Kingdom. But nonetheless, this is a pilot to, to try and engage with, with coroners. And we went through this really in 2010 when the, the FAMS network was set up. So in Scotland, it is a slightly different system. Um, deaths, uh, the, the responsible person for death investigation is, is the Lord Advocate. And it's uh, the investigation has to be organised through the fiscal service. There's a slightly different legal requirement. Things like coroner's inquests that happen in England don't happen in Scotland. Um, fatal accident inquiry replaces that. So there's slightly different laws, and I think this is an area where we, we 
do have to have separate guidance really. So this is available on our website if anyone wants to look at the details of it. But essentially it's, I, I'm showing you the guidance on the left, but I'm showing you the sort of bullet points on the right. So this is, this is very clear guidance for the pathologist doing the post-mortem, exactly how to take DNA, how to, uh, which bits of tissue to use, how much to take, and how to store it and who to contact about it. So that means any pathologist that's working in Scotland has got the same instructions on how to do it because obviously certain pathologists that are doing this all the time do it, but some, some pathologists don't, are not used to this. So we've tried to be very clear about uh, the process for a pathologist. We've also been very clear about the statement that should appear on the post-mortem report um, to go back to the fiscal. So we've given guidance on what the, the wording should be. We've also given guidance when it's an actual cardiac diagnosis at death, which is different from an, an unexplained death. The next area um, that we've pro uh, produced guidance here is, is on about how to communicate this, because the responsibility of the pathologist is to inform the fiscal and the fiscal to inform the family. So actually, at no point is the GP or the ICC service involved in any of this, and it becomes tricky to know, does the patient find the right way to, to, to a genetic service to get further investigations and family screening and things. So this is all about trying to facilitate those links. And again, it's suggested text, it's a suggested letter that the fiscal might give to the family with the contact details of the network. And uh, then the network can pass that on to the uh, local services. Now, it's not perfect. And like in England, we're continuing trying to improve this process. And, and actually, we're, we're just uh, had funding to appoint a, a clinical coordinator so that actually there'll be a person that the family can speak to, um, which I think from the feedback we've received is very much what's needed at soon after, after an unexplained death. <coughs> and then we've also got advice on how, how to investigate the relatives. Not, not so much the details of whether you should do a single average CCG or an exercise test, but more the, the process and who's responsible for doing what. So what, what do genetics take charge of? What do cardiology take charge of? What can primary care do? And um, again, this happens differently in different places, but ultimately the end point is that relatives are offered appropriate screening for the death in their family. So you definitely need a coordinating center for this and that's where our genetics up those four uh, genetic centers act as, as the the ICC services and we have monthly MDTs with pathology genetics cardiology etc so that's one example of the guidance that we've done um, there's writing guidance and then there's obviously delivering services so um, some of the examples of, of services so my service will be no different from yours. There are people that, that need to come to a service because we're not sure what the diagnosis is. And there are people that um, may be offered genetic testing. And if genetic testing's um, performed, there's then the issue of evaluating other people in the family. So that's very much what I consider to be a diagnostic need um, for patients and, and their families. And then we also have, um, like you, a large need for surveillance and screening. And this is a, a growing population of people that through the genetic testing, we've identified uh, other people potentially at risk or indeed other people with a diagnosis that perhaps didn't know they had it. So maybe asymptomatic um, conditions that need treatment or, or surveillance. So that's a service delivery uh, challenge actually for us because it's it's people that we wouldn't have found uh, before they haven't gone to, to see a cardiologist because they're symptomatic. So we've had to think of ways of how to deliver that type of care. We were fortunate to get uh, funding through the British Heart Foundation to develop nurse-led clinics and we've done this across several uh, health boards in Scotland and it was it was quite a good opportunity to to sort of expand that particular um, group of healthcare professionals. And it was done slightly differently in different areas. And that, that was fine to fit in with the local, local services. 
But what it's done is now created a group of, of um, individuals that are linked in, that are perhaps based in their local health board, but are much more closely linked into the, the uh, central genetic services. The other thing that we particularly have developed in, in the West is, is a regional approach to screening. So we have hundreds of, of patients now um, that require screening and surveillance. We have a standard, the same information is given out to, to anyone uh, about why screening is needed. With, and obviously screening is different depending on what, what you're looking for. You have a central coordinator that, that's linked in so has the family tree in front of them and can feed back the results of screening into that family tree. And then we have an agreement here in Glasgow with all of the cardiac physiology departments, it's about 23 different hospitals where we can request tests and they're done locally and the results are returned centrally. So those results are returned uh, uh, to, to me and uh, people that don't have normal test results, we will bring up to the clinic and we'll make a plan for when their next screening should be. And so a lot of this is, is all due to sort of uh, government initiatives to try and have a modern approach to outpatients. So not medicalizing people that don't need to be medicalized and delivering care as close to home as possible and ensuring that the most appropriate people see the most appropriate healthcare professionals. So it's a pyramid really of, of people that really, really need to be seen by uh, experts, people that can be managed um, with, with regular surveillance, and then people that don't need to be seen and just need to have some education about uh, uh, what to do if something changes in their family, for example. So that's the NICS network. Um, there's a steering group in the middle, um, which is, has got representatives from all the different health boards, and it's also got um, representatives from all the different professions. So that includes people from the Crown and Fiscal Service, Pathology Service, Pediatrics, Adult Cardiology, Genetics. And the terms of reference of that group is that every one of those people have to be represented. And that group links into much bigger things um, like national audit. We try to offer access to clinical trials and we've successfully managed to do that, even though it's, it's obviously difficult to set up trial centers in every health board, but we, we have got arrangements that people can be referred to centers doing clinical trials so they can access um, new treatments and things. We have a monthly education program. Anyone's welcome to join that if you want to, that's on the last Friday of the month. And we have an annual symposium, which we had uh, last week. So um, we are obviously, work closely with AICC and follow what happens in, in all the other um, parts of the UK. So, um, but that's, that's kind of where we're at in Scotland. I'm happy to take any questions or just join the panel discussion at the end. Thanks very much, Caroline. Another really interesting talk and um, good to know what's going on in services outside of the UK, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, we haven't got any questions right now, so we will um, uh, say hopefully save any other questions coming through for the for the chat later on.